Hi, it's Ernest Burkhoff, broker and CEO at Burkhoff Realty. Sit back, relax, we're about ready to review the California Residential Purchase Agreement. I want to remind you that there are two types of documents inside of real estate and inside of the RPA, the Residential Purchase Agreement Packet. One of those types is a disclosure, meaning you've been told something, and the other part is the agreement, meaning you're agreeing to something. So. We'll go over each one of these and I'll point out the uh, distinction. So the first page is the a disclosure. You've seen this before. Uh, this is the disclosure of real estate agency relationship. This says that there are three types of agents in California. One, a seller's agent, which represents the seller, to a buyer's agent that represents the buyer, and a third, an agent can represent both the buyer and the seller. When we met earlier, we mentioned that Burkhoff Realty does not represent both the buyer and the seller. It also talks about the seller and buyer responsibilities, going over briefly that the buyer's responsible for making sure that the property is in fact, uh, you know, do all the inspections and everything. And it, the seller is responsible for disclosing everything they know about the property. The second page is the law that says that you need to have been that, had that explained. Uh, third page is fair housing and discrimination advisory. This reminds you that discrimination is not just a bad idea, it's against the law. So this was reminding the buyers that these are the things that you cannot be discriminated against. And it's reminding the seller that you cannot use any of these criteria when choosing a the person to or, or people to purchase your home. That's the next two pages. Then we're into the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller disclosure. In short, this means that as much as we like you to believe and want to treat you in such a way that you think you are our only clients, uh, Burkhoff Realty does represent more than just you. And this says that there is a potential for multiple buyers and multiple sellers and the fact that Burkhoff Realty is representing more than just you. The next page is the wire fraud and electronic funds transfer advisory. So wire fraud is real. So when you get into the real estate transaction, we'll remind you over and over again, but uh, please read this over. And if someone calls you up and wants your bank number and says they're with a title company, uh, everything needs to be verified before any money is, um, is sent over. So definitely, definitely verify it's a real thing. Now, that's the end of the first part of the disclosures, and now we're going to get into the actual California residential purchase, residential purchase agreement. Let's get into the meat and potatoes. This is where the entire deal is outlined. Let's just start at the top. Uh, day prepared will be here. The offer, who it is from, the property, address, assessor's parcel number, all of that is identified in that in section one. Section two is agency. This is the section that says who is representing whom, and it'll specify the seller's brokerage firm, both the brokerage and the agent with their license number, the buyer's brokerage firm, both the brokerage and the agent and their respective license numbers as well. D, once again, reminds you that there is potentially competing buyers and sellers, and it indicates that that possible representation of more than one buyer or seller disclosure we saw earlier is included in this agreement. Let's get into the real meat and potatoes. Starting with A, purchase price will be here. All cash will be checked here. One of the things to remember, this grid section of the agreement basically specifies all the terms and then the subsequent pages of the 16 page agreement is going to specify the details behind that and we're going to go over all of it um, as we go through. So as I mentioned purchase price here, uh, close of escrow usually 30 days but we specify that here. Expiration of offer is three calendar days after the buyer's signature or sometimes strategically we may shorten that. Initial deposit 3% of the purchase price the amount will be indicated right here and that is delivered to escrow within three business days after acceptance. Increased deposit, this is something that we generally do not do, but we may, may see on the selling side. Um, so increasing a deposit would happen here and be specified. 
loan amount. So the first loan amount will be specified here with the percentage as well. We check over in this section whether it's a conventional loan by leaving it nothing checked or specify any other financing. Here is the area where we set a cap on the potential height of the um, of the interest rate. So essentially what we're saying here is it's not the rate that we're getting. We're saying if the rate goes above this, we are not going, we don't have to get a loan. Uh, we also specify if we need to pay any points here. Um, if it's an FHA or VA loan, 17 days after acceptance is what the, uh, the lender required repairs have to be done. And that's its own, own little special thing. Uh, additional financing, if any, is indicated here. Occupancy type, it's either a primary residence or secondary or an investment property is indicated here. That is for the mortgage company because that uh, has a lot to do with the interest rates. And when you add up the purchase price, the initial deposit and the loan amount, you will then end up with a balance of down payment, which will go in this line, and that will once again total up to the purchase price and be all balanced. That is the financial piece of the entire agreement all on the first page. As we get into the second page, we'll start with if we're asking for any seller credit, that amount will be here. If in fact there are any additional financial terms, that'll be indicated here. That is usually not the case. If we have, have decided to do an all cash offer, here's where we're going to say how long we have to provide our proof of funds and it's either attached with the offer or if we check this box three days after acceptance. Uh, same thing for verification of down payment and closing costs, that would be for a loan. Uh, three days after acceptance is the standard. Verification of loan application, usually we are attaching a pre-approval and that is the customary, so that is indicated over here. Final verification of condition. So. This says that within five days prior to close, we can walk through the property to make sure that the property is in materially the same shape as when we purchased it. There's something to know here though. So the final walkthrough is not a contingency. It is there to make sure that you know they did not do something drastic like steal the windows or take the doors or something like that. If in fact they did steal the windows or take the doors, then we are still closing escrow at this point. However, we will then uh, go to court and to sue them for whatever the damage was. But that's the final condition there. Assignment request, this is usually for uh, professional purchasers, investors who may want to assign it to another entity. Uh, loans. Now we're getting into the contingency section and this is important. So the contingency we usually shorten for 14 days for a loan because we can do that if in fact there is no loan contingency that box will be checked here. The appraisal contingency is here again 14 days is the standard for us. Uh, or if there's no appraisal contingency, that would be indicated here. In investigating the property, so that gives us 14 days essentially for the loan, which is uh, very typical. Investigation of property, this is for all of our home inspections and this contingency. Uh, 17 days of the default, we usually shorten that to 10 for strategic advantage. Now remember, if we shorten it to 10 and it takes longer, this contingency does not magically go away. It must be removed in writing. So strategically shortening it to 10 days is an absolutely fine process. If it takes us 12 days, if it takes us 14 days, um, no harm, no foul. Once we get it done, we remove it. So it's a very good strategic move from an offer standpoint. Um, reviewing of some, these are all the individual contingencies that are inside of that inspection contingency for reviewing seller documents, preliminary title reports, uh, common interest if it's an HOA, etc. Those are all set to our standard 10 days. The one thing to point out is we do include a full 30 days for informational access to the property. And that means that even after we remove our contingencies, we can still go to the property with notice and 
and be able to measure rooms or do what, anything we need to do like that. It does point out that just because we've we've extended that, um, once we remove contingencies, the fact we can have access is not a contingency, and it does not create any cancellation rights after that. If there are any contingencies we're removing, this box will be checked and we will include the proper signed contingency removal form. If the property, if we're purchasing this property and it is contingent on the sale of the buyer's property, that will be checked here and the appropriate form specifying the property that's being sold and all the details is the form COP and that is attached there. Time of possession. So you, this says when the keys are exchanged. So once the property is has closed, it is recorded by the county. And once that deed is recorded, upon notice of recordation, uh, that is when you can now possess the property, or we can set a time, 6 p.m. or some other time or date. If the, the seller is going to remain occupied in the property for some reason, um, we can uh, indicate that here. If there are tenants in the building, we also indicate whether or not they're going to be staying or leaving right here. Documentation and fees. Seller delivery of documents. This is specifying when the seller must deliver us documents. They have seven days to give us everything they need. Uh, sign and return escrow holder provisions. That's just specified for the escrow company at five days. Time to pay fees for ordering HOA documents. This says the seller must do that within three days. And selling smoke alarms. Uh, CO2 detect CO detectors, sorry, and water heater bracing. Those are all done by law, and the seller must do them. This says they must do that within seven days after acceptance. Evidence of representative authority. If in fact this is being bought by a entity, could be a trust, could be an LLC, then they have three days to tell us who's really buying it. Items included or excluded in the sale of the property. This is important because this is contractually specifying what comes with the home. Um, it's, this should really spend some time making sure that this is correct because um, more disagreements happen over these minor things than over the uh, over the major things. So typically, stoves are included, refrigerators are included. This specifies wine refrigerators. Sometimes they're freestanding. If they're uh, attached to the house, we would want to check that anyways. Washer and dryer, dishwasher, microwaves, video doorbells, security cameras, smart home control devices. Um, we had some issues with bathroom mirrors, so that's one of those things that's, uh, that's also there. Hot tubs, anything like that, char electric charging stations, all those things um, need to be specified here. Excluded items, we usually don't need to exclude anything, but Sometimes we'll know, you know, if there's a property that has excessive personal property, maybe it has old cars, maybe it has a bunch of junk on the backyard or something, uh, we can specify here that those items be taken away. Now, by law, even if we don't specify it, all personal property needs to be removed from the property. But if there's any ambiguity, we can just clarify that in this section right here. Allocation of cost. So these costs are, are fairly standard and the way that they're divided up are fairly standard in our county. So there's not a lot of variation here. Um, the natural hazard disclosure is paid for by the seller. The smoke alarms and CO2 and water heater bracing is paid for by the seller. Um, we don't have any government required point of sale inspections or reports at this point. Uh, escrow fees, each party pays their own. Owner's title insurance is paid by the buyer. Uh, buyer's lender insurance is paid by the buyer. City and county transfer taxes are paid by the seller. HOA fees are paid by the seller. Uh, private transfer fees are very, very rare. Um, if they are, they're almost always paid for by the seller, which is why that is the default. Uh, home warranty plans can be paid by the buyer, seller, both. Uh, and this is where we actually uh, specify the cap for what that would be and who would provide it. And then finally, if there are any other terms that need to be specified, again, this is rare, but sometimes uh, it's needed, that will go right there. 
property advisory. So this is the boxes that check what's actually other forms that may be included in this agreement because the 16 pages of the residential purchase agreement plus, plus the additional pages for 25 pages might not be enough. So here's where we actually add any of the other things that may be required. Uh, these are the things that are automatically included with the, with the uh, purchase agreement. Let's get into now the specific terms. So the above part of the agreement, that is just the grid system. It makes it easy to reference any of the key elements of it. This is the part, and we're starting into what really explains what each one of those things mean. So the, the first one are the deposits. Uh, the initial deposit, what happens if we increase deposit, uh, the retention of the prop deposit, how that it stays in in escrow um, unless something something changes and it needs to be dispersed according to what this agreement will say this specifies the all cash offer and says that it's not contingent on the buyer obtaining a loan for obvious reasons this just specifies clearly what loans mean by first loan additional financing uh, fha va etc Balance of purchase price and down payments. This, again, just specifying what that is. Limits on credits to buyers. This explains that if we're if the seller does a credit, it may be limited by the lender uh, because the lender will always want to have some amount of down payment. They want the buyer to have some skin in the game. So if the credit would zero out the down payment, then um, they, won't, they won't allow it to go any further than that. Additional financing terms, uh, verification of down payment and closing costs is just specifying exactly how that happens. Closing in possession, occupancy, as long as that was checked, it says buyer intends to occupy the property. Condition of the property at closing, this says unless otherwise agrees, the property shall be delivered as is in its present physical condition at the date of acceptance of offer. Now what that means, it does not mean that we cannot negotiate. As is at its present physical condition simply means this is the property and, and this is, you know, this is the exact property. They're not planning on building a bigger property, doing any remodeling or anything like that. Now, if there's anything that we find in our inspection reports, uh, we can obviously go back and, and negotiate, but technically and legally, it is being sold as is in its present condition. That's just the legal term for it. Seller remaining in possession after close of escrow. This specifies uh, what happens if the seller is going to remain, and we've agreed to that. At close of escrow, this is just explaining what goes on at the close of escrow and what the escrow company needs to do. Contingencies and removal of contingencies. So this is important, is this specifies when the buyer's deposit is at risk. So for loans, it says, you know, the buyer is going to pursue the loan that they set. Now, if the buyer changes and decides to pursue another loan, that's perfectly okay. However, uh, they cannot back out of the agreement because the better loan that they were pursuing did not happen because they still have to pursue the loan that they said they were going to do. So that's what that says. Um, appraisal contingency, this explains that the appraisal contingency, it has to appraise it what it, it says uh, and what happens if they have a no appraisal contingency. We also are including here the Fair Appraisal Act form, and we'll review that at the end. Investigation of property. Uh, so this property is contingent upon the, the buyer's acceptance of the condition and matters affecting the property. That's what it says there. We must review all the documents. We get to review title. We get to review the condominium, if, if, if it is, or plan development, all of those documents. Um, any leased or leaned items and then we get down into the removal of waiver of contingencies with the offer if the offer comes in without uh, contingencies in other words they removed it before they investigate it this really says wow you really really need to uh, have looked at everything over because that's a, a, a very big deal removal of contingency or cancellation so this explains what happens 
when the contingencies are removed. And it says it must be done in writing and the seller has the ability, if the date goes through, goes past the agreed upon amount. So let's say we did say a 10 day inspection contingency and now it's day 11. This says that the seller's recourse is to give us a notice of, to perform. And in that notice of, to perform, um, we have two days to remove that contingency or the seller can cancel the agreement and give us the deposit back. So that is this entire section right through, through here. Items included or excluded from sale. This just goes into the specifics on what was what was checked above. Allocation of costs. This again just explains that what is, is legally required and who needs to pay for, for what according to the boxes that we checked above, saying who was going to do it, including the home warranty here. Statutory and other disclosures, including lead-based paint and hazards. Now this talks about the actual disclosures that the seller must provide us by law. Uh, the TDS, the NHD, so that's the uh, disclosures that are statutory. The lead disclosure is also statutory. I'm sorry, the, and the TDS is transfer disclosure statement and NHD is natural hazard disclosure. I, I say these things so much, I apologize for using the, the, uh, the shorthand. Home fire hardening disclosure. This is a new advisory that has been added as of um, uh, as of last year, and it's for any home that's built before 2010. Defensible space. We've had a lot of wire, wildfire disclosures that have been added. Um, waiver prohibition. All of these things are kind of into the uh, the legal things that are, are saying that this is the agreement and the agreement is in writing and nothing else is actually uh, actually applying. Withholding taxes talks about uh, when taxes need to be withheld. That's a, a rare thing. Uh, Megan's Law database. There is something called Megan's Law and it is disclosed here. Notice regarding gas and hazardous liquid transmission pipelines since the uh, PG&E did um, blow up a neighborhood. Uh, it was back in 2010, somewhere in there. Um, they now have a place where you can look to see if there are any underground gas transmission lines under the property. Good news, nothing in Sonoma County. Condominium plan development disclosures. Uh, again, just talking about that. Natural hazard environmental. Um, this is once again saying that you will receive some natural hazard disclosures and you need to read those over carefully as a buyer. Buyer investigating property and matters affecting the property. This whole section is explaining that the buyer really needs to be satisfied and they need to satisfy themselves that the property is what, they're, what they want. So um, no one else can do that for the buyer and this, the buyer is really encouraged to do it. So what we, you know, even though we do do our home inspection, pest inspection, all of the, all of the basics, absolutely Anything else that needs to happen to make the buyer comfortable uh, needs to needs to go on. And there's a good reason for that. Um, here's the section that says during any inspections, if somebody gets hurt, the buyer, um, it's you know, it, no one can go back on the seller. Title investing. This is explaining everything about how to do title investing. That's something to discuss with the title company. Time periods for removal of contingency and cancellation rights. This explains in detail the length and the process of removing contingencies. And just as I explained before, it tells the seller that the seller has the right to, once the, the time period is expired, to demand that that contingency be removed. It's a two day notice to perform. And if the buyer doesn't, the seller then has the option to cancel the agreement and return the deposit. So that's this entire section right through here. And all the way through, including the demand close escrow, etc. Uh, repairs under number 15. That says that if we request any repairs, the seller must do it in a workmanlike way. It doesn't say that they have to hire a licensed contractor. They could do it themselves, but they do agree to do it in what would be a professional workman's like way by contract. Final verification and condition. This is where it specifies it's not a contingency of sale, as I explained earlier. 
proration of property taxes. So when you purchase a home, the property taxes, which are usually paid in advance, the property taxes are, are essentially set for the day that escrow is closed, which means if the seller has paid more, they get that portion back and the buyer pays the property taxes. So everyone's only paying property taxes for the actual time that they actually own the home. And that's what the proration does. Uh, brokers and agents, this explains um, that, you know, there is compensation that is going to be provided through the uh, through the MLS and the agreements and the scope of duty This says that yes real estate agents do this all the time and we are professionals however um, we aren't lawyers and we though we see a lot of homes we are not professional inspectors so this is this is what what explains that the joint escrow instructions this section is really for the title company that just legally says you need to do what is inside of this agreement the title company selection of service providers this specifies that you know the buyer or the seller whoever is is, is hiring the, the people are the ones who ultimately get to make that choice the agents don't get to tell you what you need to do though we obviously uh, are happy to advise multiple listing service this just says that it was in the multiple listing service attorney fees and cost loser pays assignments again this is usually just for professionals but professional investors sometimes buy a property and then they need to assign it to something else normal uh, home buyers sometimes assign it to a trust before escrow but that's again rare Equal housing opportunity, it's not just a good idea, it's the law. Definitions and instructions is number 25, and this is just all the legal definitions that need to be included inside of a contract. Terms and conditions of the offer, this explains that this is, in fact, the offer, and there is nothing else that's outside of the, the writing. Time is of the essence in contracts, they always are. Legally authorized signer, this is specifying that who is signing is swearing that they are in fact legally authorized to sign. Now we'll get into number 29, liquidated damages. So this becomes a little bit of an awkward moment because um, I have to say I am not an attorney, nor do I play one on TV, and I cannot give legal advice. However, I need to explain what these are. So. Liquidated damages essentially says that if something happens, then the buyer is never going to be liable for more than 3% of the purchase price. So um, this is why there's a 3% initial deposit. So once all the contingencies are, are removed and the buyer is committed to buying the property, if something happens and they change their mind, the seller cannot come back for anything more than the 3% and no more than 3%. So this is usually considered to be something um, that is good for both buyers and sellers. Number 30, mediation. If anything goes awry with this agreement, everybody automatically is agreeing to at least start with mediation to see if we can get any any resolution. If mediation doesn't work, then the next section is arbitrations of dispute. So this section, if one agrees to it, is agreeing to settle any disputes by arbitration as opposed to jury trial. Um, it's really a personal choice on that one but that's what that section is. Expiration of offer. Um, this says that the offer is going to expire in the time frame that we listed on the front page. Entity buyers, again, if you're an LLC, this is where this uh, section is checked. For most people, this is just the signature saying, yes, in fact, I am, I am ready to put my offer in. Once the offer is in, the acceptance happens here, either a backup, uh, counter offer, or an acceptance simply by signing it uh, right there. The next section is the broker section, which explains what the brokers are, who they are, their license number, and is telling the title company who, who are the brokers that are brokering the deal. Uh, the escrow holder, this is the title company. Um, this is where they fill in all of their information so that there's a record of who's doing that. Okay, and that is the full, look at this, 16 pages of the agreement. On to the next few pages.
So that's the end of the agreement part, and now we're back into disclosures. So the very next one is the buyer investigation advisory. So this is advising the buyer again, and the buyer is advised multiple times throughout the process and throughout these documents that you are strongly advised to investigate the condition and suitability of all aspects of the property, including but not limited to the following. If you do not, you are acting against the advice of brokers. This is essentially um, saying, hey, real estate brokers are telling you, you need to do this. If you don't, it's your own fault. It's kind of a cover the brokers um, section. But it, this is something that absolutely should be read through. Uh, everything from, these are just good things to, to read through and say, hmm, have I really thought about this? These are all some of the issues. There's a whole nother 14-page uh, document that comes up with even more things to consider, including things like, if you live on a golf course, you may end up with golf balls in your yard. There's a whole section on that. Excellent. On to the next one. Fair Appraisal Act Addendum. This is a fairly new form and I'm glad that they have added this. This is stating that um, appraisals and appraisers cannot discriminate uh, from buyers or sellers based on any protected statuses. Uh, everything from religious dress, grooming practices, anything. Um, appraisals should be appraised and that should not be be contingent upon who's buying or selling the property that just makes sense this also is alerting the buyer and the seller that if they believe any of this has happened that this is the place to go to make a complaint after you notify your brokers as well because appraisals need to be done professionally and they should not have any discrimination in them at all the California Consumer Privacy Act Advisory. Uh, by law, California, we need to talk about the fact that in buying and selling real estate, your personal information is going to be in the hands of things like brokers and title companies and mortgage people, and you need to be aware of your rights that they're not going to be able to sell that or give it away and all that stuff. So, we have made it to the end.